uh, I'm very excited to present my first scientific poster and there's a lot to cover so let's jump right into it. Um, I'm going to talk about large-scale quantum chemical calculations and I'll explain the title as we go along. So just to give a little bit of a background, my research has been focusing on density functional theory or DFT for short and DFT is actually the most widely used method for quantum chemical and material calculations. Even though it is computationally more feasible to implement the other quantum methods, uh, large-scale calculations are still prohibited by the fact that computational effort scales cubically with the size of the system. So that's been an issue in the scientific community and a software called very successful. So first of all, I'm going to show uh, how the density matrix, which is a central element in DFT is formulated, linear scaling DFT is formulated, uh, constructed. Um, so one tap uses localized orbitals, uh, psi, alpha and psi, beta, and in between them lines the density kernels. Uh, again, something quite important. Um, but probably the most important development was using a, a principle uh, called the nearsightedness of electronic matter. This principle was introduced by Walter Kohn, a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And to quote him, uh, Kohn said that local electronic properties such as the density depend significantly on the effective potential only at nearby points. So what does that mean for us? It means that interactions between electrons at a large uh, atomic range can be neglected. And one visual way to represent that is uh, can be seen in the figure in the middle. So there are two heat maps from a, a total energy calculation we did on a protein. Uh, on the left, we can see the distances between all atoms. Uh, and on the right, we see the density kernel from the end of our calculation. Now, what we can see immediately is the pattern between the two heat maps uh, matches. And on the left, we see that as darker the color, uh, the elements are closer to each other. As soon as the distance increases between elements, we can see on the right that most values are either zero or very close to zero and can be neglected. Now, one that implements this principle by applying a truncation scheme to the density kernel. And at the moment, it uses one distance parameter for all atoms. So say the user sets it to 40 bore, and then all the interactions between electrons will be neglected over that range. Now, as chemists, we know that elements differ in shape, size, electronic properties. And so the current truncation scheme is not the most sensitive one. And so in this project, we've been working on developing a new one, which uh, is actually element pair specific. So how did we do that? First, we uh, did total energy calculations on T4 lysozyme, a protein, uh, with either no cutoff or with various uh, setups for cutoffs. We investigated how the current truncation scheme affects calculations in one tap, uh, which is an iterative process. And using the distance arrays, as can be seen in the figure uh, in the middle, in combination with the density kernels, we decided to study the interactions between elements, specifically uh, the ranges. And so you can see an example for a Python script I wrote, which tells us that using a threshold of 10 to the minus 5, uh, those are the maximum ranges for interactions. Anything above that can be disregarded. So, uh, for example, nitrogen, nitrogen is almost 84. Now, uh, we managed to implement this new method in one tap and we tested it as well. Um, in terms of calculations, in comparison with the uh, traditional cutoff, the new calculations outperform them with respect to total energy. And that is a great thing because 
by nature of the variational principle in quantum mechanics that meant that we achieved more accurate results. But slightly controversially, the convergence rates in these iterative calculations were poor. So that remains to be investigated. And this is why I gave the title uh, nearer the nearsightedness principle, because even though we are now one step nearer, there is still a lot to research. So I would love to look into in the future in uh, how the, the radii for the orbitals we set for the calculations effect calculations, as well as using these new cutoffs we acquired as descriptors in machine learning. And that concludes my presentation. is combining all the sonic measurement and the machine learning methods to assess bake product quality. If I need to start with the why we choose the bake product, bake product is one of the most popular ready to eat snack in the world. Their market share is go, growing uh, steadily. And uh, for ultrasonic sensors, uh, we use the ultrasonic sensors uh, because of their, such, uh, their lots of advantages such as the low cost, non-destructive, and the online technologies. In this project, we, we try to combine ultrasonic measurement and the machine learning methods to determine the physical parameters of the baked products, such as the texture or moisture level. In our methodology, I can tell we will we start with the baked product preparation. In first experiment, we just bought the final product from the any supermarket. Uh, but uh, now we are making our own biscuits. After the uh, bake product preparation, we just set up the experimental ultrasonic uh, setup. Uh, as you can see the, uh, the poster that there is a typical ultrasound setup for experimental measurement. Uh, on the left, left side of the experimental setup, you will see the Pundit Lab. We call it the Pundit Lab for contact ultrasound. Uh, there's a two transducer and we are just putting the biscuit between these two transducers. Then we are sending the sound wave through the transducer and the biscuits. And we are getting the signal via the oscilloscope. After we getting uh, acquiring this data, we are just explore the data. We are doing some normal uh, outlying or normalization. After that, we, we choose the model for machine learning. Uh, which model, which algorithm is uh, perform best for us? Uh, we tried lots of, well, lots of things, uh, and the, we just try to develop and the training the model. After we getting the results, we are trying to compare other machine learning algorithms. Uh, in the results section, you will see it's the only uh, made by Excel. The clear difference between the speed of sound and the breaking force. Uh, features of the biscuits. Uh, if I need to start with the uh, the features of the uh, our results, uh, we you, we just collect the speed of sound of the biscuits, the time of flight of the biscuits, and distance values of the biscuits, and the amplitude, the energy values of the biscuits. After we getting these features, we just compare with, for example, speed of sound versus p breaking force for wet and the dry biscuits. The, as it is easily can be seen from the table, there is a huge difference on the wet and the dry biscuits. Yeah, this was a lower, a small number of the samples uh, around a hundred, but it uh, still showed difference in the ultrasonic results. When it comes to machine learning results on the right side of the poster, you will see there is a, a, a original waveform uh, getting from the oscilloscope. Uh, we just record this data and the features of the original one. And then we just want to be sure about the, the, our results. So we just want to window the original waveforms into four different pieces by using the envelope detection. Then we also record their, the, or their the four C waveform energy and the amplitude values. After we have the 11 different independent features for machine learning algorithms. We start with the support vector machine, then we continue with the decision trees and the artificial neural network. As you can see, the 
uh, below of the poster, right below side of the poster, uh, we almost get 99 percentage of the the correct classification rate for support vector machine and decision trees. For artificial neural network, we have 100 percentage uh, correct classification rate for speed of the and speed of sound to energy values. When it comes to the uh, amplitude to energy values, we we get again similar result with the speed of sound to energy. When I just divide into uh, different uh, different part of the signal, we get the lower accuracy. So we thought the, the multiple waveform or original waveform is better than the uh, other one. When it comes to regression of the, uh, our algorithm to predict the moisture content in the biscuits, we use the same algorithm, support vector machine decision trees and the artificial neural network. And this time we call, we look to R squared values. And when we look to R squared values, we can tell the speed of sound to energy values work better than others. And we can say the divided waveforms for first part, second part, and the third part work, than, work better than the other first, second, or third part. So these are all I have to say for my poster for future work. We are continue make biscuits now. Yeah, we are we we are we then we will use another machine machine learning algorithms for future. Thank you. So today my presentation is on the development of an interactive knowledge-based solvent selection tool. So solvent use is a fundamental part of chemical processes. It consists of about 80% of the total volume of chemicals used in industry. However, many solvents, especially more traditionally used solvents, have negative safety, health, and environmental issues, or SHE issues. Examples of this can include issues regarding being carcinogenic, non-renewable sourcing, difficulty with disposal. The list can go on, to be honest. Um, this being said, as solvents are so important in, in industry, they can't just be removed, they must be replaced with greener alternatives. So this research demonstrates the development of solvent selection, of a solvent selection tool to find those greener alternatives through similarities in molecular properties with principal component analysis. With this method, solvating properties are considered to ensure effective replacement of solvents in a chemical sense, alongside SHE analysis, which considers the greenness of solvents. It was then planned to create a 2D map of solvents so that solvents in proximity to each other had similar chemical properties and therefore would be effective substitutes. In order to develop this tool, we first had to create a solvent database. This began with the compilation of a solvent list of about 40 chemicals, which was derived from a variety of solvent selection guides. A key factor in choosing these solvents was making sure there was a mix of traditional and more greener, environmentally safe solvents too. From here, solvents then needed to be characterized through a set of descriptors. 21 descriptors were chosen, which covered physical properties. They also covered um, polarizability, solubility, size and shape, as well as SHE impact. And these descriptors were chosen on the basis of them having a wide range of continuous data for effective analysis. Once the data was all collected, we were able to plot it onto a 2D map using PCA. So PCA, principal component analysis, is a tool that can reduce the dimensionality of data, but still maintain variance. So in the context of this research, it was able to take this really large data set of 21 descriptors, 40 different solvents, and map it onto a more user interpretable interface so people could really understand what was going on. Um, this was all uploaded onto Invis to produce the map. And so solvents near each other had a lot of similar properties and the user could apply their own knowledge to which solvents were good and bad environmentally and safe and in regards to safety as well. 
Um, and they could also move points closer together, um, depending on if they worked well for their reaction. So as you can see in the results, we were able to make the map. In panel A, you can see the map when it was first opened and see how solvents with similar properties have been grouped together successfully through their different colors. Panels B and C show the interactive aspect of the tool. So you can see how two methyl THF and diethyl ether are moved together and how the rest of the map really changes um, in respect to that. And then to summarize, we have used PCA to create this solvent selection tool and produce a map with interactive features as seen in panels A, B, and C. Improvements for the future generally center around the accessibility of the tool. So one of the main issues with the tool is that there can be some difficulty in the interactive feature where moving points can be difficult and it can be kind of slow moving. So that is to be improved in the future. Alongside that, the tool only runs in Linux at the moment, which is limiting. And on top of that, the interface is slightly outdated aesthetically. So these changes plan on being made in the future by the rest of the team with AI for green chemistry at Nottingham. And we are excited to see how this tool develops. Thank you all for listening. And if there are any questions, I'm free to answer any of them. Uh, first off, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Longino. I'm from the University of Strathclyde, and I've been working with Reed Group Research over the last 10 weeks. Unlike many of the other interns here, my research is as a computer scientist aiding chemistry. I've avoided showing any code, both to protect the software and because the amount I could fit on the poster really wouldn't help to convey the process. If you have any questions about the technical side, feel free to send me a message or to ask at the end. So the main piece of research I have been working on is in using computer vision AI to tackle the analysis bottleneck that occurs in high throughput chemical processes. Specifically for my research, HPLC or high performance liquid chromatography. So this bottleneck occurs when you're analyzing a group of chemical samples. These samples could be on a 96 or 128 well plates, although plates can go up to 1,536 wells that I've seen. Traditional methods are able to analyze the results sequentially, where each one could take several minutes, cumulatively taking hours just to analyze a 96 well plate. And it can take literal days of analysis for the largest plates. And this obviously consumes a lot of valuable time on a fairly mundane task. So my research seeks to supplement existing technology using computer vision software and simple hardware such as cameras to provide rapid analysis, which allows HPLC machines to be used only where needed, saving time and costs, allowing researchers to spend more time on results. It's also very accessible. At the moment, you just need a computer and a video or a camera input. The process begins with color space analysis, and we are analyzing the data in the first frame of the video, splitting it into different color spaces, such as RGB and HSV, and into multiple channels. This is just to give you a view to help determine how we want to reduce the range in the next step. We create histograms from the data to further analyze the image and the samples determining how to separate samples from the background plate. After we've got this data, we can start the process of creating a mask and using computer vision to select locations of samples to pass into existing kinematic chemical video analysis code. The first step is to reduce the image, limiting it to only contain the pixels in a range determined by the color space analysis. After this, we can perform morphology, which is a series of nonlinear filters to process the image and remove artifacts from the image, such as light, gate, light glare. After this, canny edge detection is applied to the image. This is a multi-stage algorithm, which finds the edges of an object. Um, this increases robustness, and ensures that we are detecting all of the samples. And finally, after this, an overlay of where the program has detected the samples allows the user to ensure it's working as intended. There are multiple steps throughout the process um, to ensure that it's all working as intended, and you just press a key on your keyboard to continue. Finally, the program draws bounding boxes and gathers coordinate data from the image to be passed into the kinematic video analysis software. 
the high throughput implementation of the research group's analysis code I've worked on has the potential to cut down the total analysis time by as much as 90%. And this not only cuts costs, but somewhat automates a very tedious process, meaning chemists can spend their time on more important tasks. Um, apart from this, the software is also capable of displaying center of mass of each sample as well as working on test tube arrays. And a step not shown is the locating and cropping of the well plate from a full image to ensure that you're not getting any other artifacts from the background being selected. Further work to enhance the software includes developing the granularity to find very small samples and very large plates, selecting samples which are significantly discolored from the mean and always being able to locate all samples, even if they are significantly different chemical compositions. Um, I'd like to thank Mark Reed and the rest of the research group for the help they provided over the last 10 weeks, as well as AI Free SD Network for the funding provided. Thank you. I'm a theoretical physics student at the University of Sheffield, and this summer I've been um, I've been working with Professor Nigel Clark on investigating de-wetting and thin liquid films, as well as using machine learning to determine the dominant features of an evolution equation. So, why do we care about this? Well, first of all, material development is a very slow process, relies primarily on trial and error, and um, if we can tailor materials to a system using a specifically developed model from data for that system, then it will greatly speed up the whole process. And um, like in this example, we simulate data from the thin film equation, which is the simplest model to describe de-wetting in films. However, since it's the simplest model, um, there's some physics that's not accounted for, which is why learning the evolution equation directly from the data is so valuable so that we don't have to rely on any assumptions. So the theory behind de-wetting, um, basically liquids placed on a repellent surface um, tend to retract themselves uh, in forms of droplets as seen in figure one. And the key force affecting the motion is the local surface tension. However, the surface tension doesn't take into account um, differences in the chemistry between the liquid and the substrate. For example, how water will spread on glass, but kind of beads up on a frying pan or something. So to account for this, we had this term called the disjoining pressure, which accounts for these intermolecular forces between the different substances. And um, let's see. In practice, one of the most powerful tools for recording evolution data for these thin films, which are on the order of less than 100 nanometers in this simulation, I used one around 10 nanometers, so very, very small. Um, we use um, small angle scattering, so we're able to collect data in the form of a power spectrum, and that's the inverse space data that we use for the machine learning method, which I'm moving on to. So the we already know the evolution equation, obviously, but we're working backwards from the simulated data to relearn that equation. So following Schaefer's method, we start with a generic Taylor expansion differential equation reasonable for the system. So in this case, we use the Navier-Stokes equations for um, viscous fluid. And then we can separate out the coefficients of that expansion, which will be the unknowns. And we're trying to shrink some of them down to zero and some of them not to zero so that we can end up with those key uh, features at the end. So then we go to the lasso um, method, shrinkage method, which combines using least squares and the L1 norm to compare numerical derivatives from the data to the analytical ones in the candidate function. And we calculate these um, derivatives via the finite difference method. And we shrink down the coefficients that are less important and they're all normalized. So none of them have a, 
heavier weight than others. And then we result in uh, variable selection and we result with the key figures. So the results for this is I simulated data on a 50 by 50 lattice over 800,000 time steps. Figure two shows the gradual formation of ridges and valleys in the film. And if I were to continue the simulation, which I haven't just due to timing, it would um, eventually result in complete droplets. And the 2D height data has been transformed to the Fourier domain, which it would be collected in, um, in practice. And it's been flattened and the derivatives calculated, put into the feature matrix. And we're currently working on the minimization problem to determine the non-zero coefficients of del h, del h cubed, and del squared h, which you can see are prominent in the, um, the thin film equation uh, introduced in the theory section. And confirming these will give us a new tool to help determine PDEs of a system, even without a physical model, which is pretty cool. So finishing up this project, I'm going to apply this to small angle scattering data, which already exists in our group. And other relevant research includes differences in de-wetting morphologies, patterns, and how we can control the de-wetting process by altering the chemistry of the system in between the two substances. And yeah, so utilizing machine learning will allow us to learn these dynamics of new systems more efficiently than just trial and error alone, or at least it will point us in the right direction for, um, for experimental work. And yeah, so sparse optimization is an extremely powerful tool, uh, develops or it helps us um, discover a system's dominant features. And for soft matter in particular, there's many applications and I feel like this is a really, yeah, good tool. So if anyone has any questions, let me know. Um, yeah, my name is Max. I'm a FAMC student at the Freie Universität in Berlin, Germany. And my project was first about creating a merged data set from two sources with the aim to learn the methodic. Um, but during the period of the internship, the project evolved and so an abundance of ideas with it. So the title of this poster is creating a merged data set and, and, uh, and investigation of correlations in the data with self organizing map and variational out and corner models. Uh, yeah, and as if you will see, as you will see, the machine learning part of my project focuses more on the methodic than on chemistry itself. Okay, first, briefly, I will first talk a little bit about the, about the data set. Um, well, it's merged from two data sets. The first one, the Henry, Henry's Law data, was provided alongside a paper by Sanders et al. It contains about 4,600 species. Um, for that there's smiles and the Henry's law constant. And the second data set I used, uh, it contains the intrinsic solubility values for around 3,600 species, and it was created by Wang et al. Um, and on the poster, you can see the head of the merged data set I created from these two data sets. And the histograms on the poster, they show the distributions of the smile lengths the smiles lengths and the Henry's law constants and the intrinsic solubility in the merged data set. So, and as I was looking for a way to maybe identify and identify relationships between certain properties of the molecules and also to cluster molecules with similar properties, two methods came to mind. First, a coherent map, also called self organizing map, and also a variational autoencoder. So first to explore if a causal relation between certain molecular descriptors and thermodynamic properties of the molecules exists, I trained a cohone map on the Lipinski descriptors and the Henry's law constants of the compounds in the merged data set. And the map is displayed here as a U matrix. And each dot in the map represents a compound in the data set and is labeled by the intrinsic solubility. 
a blue color indicates the logarithmic intrinsic solubility lies above zero, and the green color indicates a value below zero. And what's really interesting here is that you can clearly see a clustering of compounds with a value above the spe specific threshold. So clustering and shapes in the maps are just a correlation, which could be further investigated. And the second method I used for clustering is a variational autoencoder. It consists, this model consists of an encoder, which is fed with the features from the molecules and converts them into an abstract latent space representation. And this is followed by a decoder, which converts this representation back to the feature vector we fed our encoder with. So in fact, it's constructed nearly the same way like a standard deep learning autoencoder, but with a huge difference that our encoded feature vector is a normal distribution over the latent space, which leads to a far more organized latent space. So generally spoken, two molecules with similar features like closer to each other in latent space than two molecules with different features. And in this case here, the molecule smiles were used as features. And to display clustering, principal component analysis was applied on the latent, latent vectors from the molecules in the data set. So each dot in the plot represents a molecule and its color displays the logarithmic intrinsic solubility. Um, it's the plot in the bottom right. And yeah, at this point, I was thinking about what if I would train neural net to predict certain properties of a molecule, like the intrinsic solubility, with the molecule's latent space representation as feature vector. And what if there's a way to look into this black box neural net to gain information on which part of the molecule's structure the network focuses for its prediction. And one answer could be LRP, uh, layer-wise relevance propagation. It's an algorithm that back, back propagates a relevance score calculated from the outputs through the network so that every feature fed into the network get its own relevance score. And here I programmed a really simple example um, at the top right from my poster. It's a picture from, uh, yeah, there are pictures from handwritten digits. They are fed into an variational autoencoder and the latent vector is fed into a classifier model. Then LRP is calculated from the classifier outputs. And you can see this result on the poster. It seems that certain parts of the picture were particularly relevant for the prediction. So um, yeah, my next thought was what could be the best model to make predict predictions uh, like the solubility on a structural formula and a solution with really good results is a messenger passing neural network um, as proposed by Gilm et al. And here the network iterates over the whole structure taking detailed bond and atom properties into account. So if it succeeded to implement an algorithm like LRP in such a network, it would not just be possible to see which molecular structures are important for certain properties, like high solubility, but also which further atom and bond properties are important, like quantum -manic uh, mechanical properties, hybridization, one type, et cetera. And this could be also used in pharmaceutical sciences. What's really interesting to identify which parts of the molecular structure of a drug are important for binding to the protein target. And many other applications may also be possible. But unfortunately, the internship ended before I could complete this complex task, but I'm hoping to get back to it soon. All right, um, yeah, I'm at the end of my presentation. So um, my project was on applying Bayesian optimization to chemistry. So many problems in science can be framed as optimization problems. And for example, reaction yield optimization. You might have four different pressures, three different concentrations, seven different temperatures, and you want to figure out the set of conditions that optimizes the reaction yield. Of course, in real life, chemical reactions can take hours or days to complete. So it's not exactly feasible to test every single possible combination. So the, the idea of Bayesian optimization then 
is to do a few initial observations and then fit some statistical model to your data that at each point computes an expected value and an uncertainty. So here I've given an example of optimizing mathematical function f of x equals x sine x. Um, and here the blue indicates uncertainty. So then from that, you choose by some heuristic what your next observation will be. You might choose, for example, the one that has the maximum uncertainty to so exploring new areas of the space, or maybe the maximum expected value. So you're improving on a current best guess. But in practice, you use some sort of balanced approach, like a third point of interest that you apply from there. So the optimizer that we used throughout the project, um, which was called the Edver optimizer, was from a paper that was looking at, among other things, this Suzuki reaction yield data set. So if we, so we tested it with a 50 experiment budget, essentially. so it evaluated 50 points overall. Um, but of course, if you're doing reactions in real life, it makes sense to do them, do them parallel, right? So if you do one reaction at a time, that'll take a lot longer than if you do five reactions at a time. But of course, if you do one reaction at a time, then after each reaction, you're updating your model. Whereas if you do five reactions at a time, you only update it after every fifth reaction. You have to do more guesswork. We wanted to see whether the performance was adversely impacted by increasing the batch size. So we ran it with batch sizes from one to 10 um, with a 50 experiment budget, running it each time 50 times and plotting the average of the curve. So we tested it with three different methods for choosing the next experiment. The first one acted as a sort of control, just choosing it randomly. The second and the other two were expected improvement here in purple and top and sampling here in blue, which are just standard acquisition functions um, that you find in the literature. And as you can see, according to the heights, Performance looks relatively stable across batch sizes, um, which was good. And expression improvement seems to consistently outperform some of the sampling as well. So next, we decided to take it out of the domain of the actual yield optimization and instead apply it to this Harvard Clean Energy Project data set. So again, we use the same three methods here. This time, I, we used um, 10 rounds of a batch size of 10, so 100 experiments in total. And again, the optimizer did perform better than the control here. Um, one interesting thing to note is, although again, success improvement did outperform top and sample, we have very, very similar performance, um, but running on the computer itself, success improvement takes around four times as long to compute. So top and sampling, although slightly worse, is usually much more efficient. And then finally, we took it back into the domain of reaction yield optimization with this data set gotten from a paper that was exploring animal scale high throughput screening. So in this case, the measure of yield was the area counts under an LCMS. So initially, when we looked at the possible condition, so like say five different ligands, 10 different solvents, et cetera, et cetera, we multiplied them all together. We had about 3,000 possible combinations. But in the paper itself, we only found data of about 1,500. So they obviously left a few holes in the domain. And initially what we did is that we coded it so the holes were given a default of zero, which are indicated by the paler colors in this box plot here. Um, but that seemed to lead me to pretty poor optimized performance. So what we did after that, is instead of multiplying together all possible conditions, we looked at the 1,500 that we've been given and just restricted it to that particular domain. And that seems to improve performance. So in conclusion, I'd say we did manage to do what we set out to do, which was show that Bayesian optimization is a technique that you can apply to a wide range of problems in chemistry. And in science in general, if you have any sort of optimization problem where it's either time or resource intensive to actually test out a particular configuration, this method might be useful. And in terms of future work you could do here, um, you could look at what are called noisy functions. So, uh, so you can see in the top left, um, the blue uncertainty shrinks to zero at the observation. So maybe in real life, if you do a reaction with the same conditions, you might get a slightly different yield each time. You can build in some non-zero uncertainty into your observations themselves, which might decrease if you evaluate it multiple times. And finally, I'd like to thank Professor Naranjan and Professor Frey, and also my supervisor, Dr. Gao, for the industry in the project, and also the AI3 Science Network um, for giving me the opportunity to do this. I went to the University of Warwick and I studied maths. Um, 
and our project was to do with trying to generate unseen molecules of a particular class. So in our case, we um, looked at optoelectric molecules. Um, we used a generative model to try to do this. Um, it was originally developed for smaller um, molecules and they weren't as difficult to kind of structure or predict. Um, the exact model we use is called GSNEP. Um, it's an autoregressive model, um, which means it allows us to take different input vectors over time. So in this case, it's quite useful because um, as our, we try to build up our molecule when it's generating, um, the number of atoms in the molecule will increase over time, um, so which makes this particular model very useful. Um, exactly how our model generates new molecules is it initially generates a atom or an element, and then it tries to build off this atom conditionally. So first off, it would take one atom and then it'll build a couple or three of the one atom, and then it would go through all the molecules in that existing, um, go through all the existing atoms in that molecule and then try to build more atoms off this um, original molecule. Um, so as you can see, this kind of uh, molecule increase in size over time, which makes the model very useful. Um, the exact um, data set we use is called OE62. Um, it consists of 62,000 optoelectric molecules, which are in their most relaxed state or the lowest energy level in terms of the geometry. Um, this particular data set had um, molecules of between 100, 0 to 120, um, with a couple slightly more than that. Um, and it consists of loads and loads of different types of um, elements, which makes this kind of task quite interesting. Um, so once we've um, trained our model, um, we can use it to generate a database of um, hopefully new molecules as well as maybe some which were originally in the data set. Um, and then to measure its performance, we looked at its bond angles and um, the rings it produced and different bond lengths. Um, as you can see from the graphs, it was actually very good. Um, it matched very closely to the original data set, um, which is good for our project. Um, then the final part of our project was to try to create a biased model so that um, our model would predict molecules in the optoelectric kind of class that um, had useful properties. So in our case, we were looking for molecules with a small homo luma gap. So that's the, um, the energy difference between the highest occupied orbital in the molecule and the lowest occupied orbital. Um, so we would generate a database and then we would select specific molecules which match this requirement. And then um, we would retrain our generative model um, and we keep trying to cycle around until eventually we'll get better and better molecules with a smaller homo luma gap. Um, and this is the results after one loop. Um, so as you can see, I hope you can see the, um, the index, but um, the blue and the orange are the homo and lumo energies. And you can see they're close together in the original data set, which is the green and red um, lines in the graph. Um, yeah, so this kind of structure of this kind of loop can be used for other classes of molecules, um, not just optoelectric molecules, um, but we'd hopefully try to that in future work. Um, yeah, I think that's it.